Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. Joining us is Bruce L. Benson, DeVoy L. Moore professor and distinguished research professor at Florida State University and courtesy professor of law at Florida State University College of Law. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Bruce. Thank you. Your book, uh, The Enterprise of Law, is stri- strikes many, I would say, as probably quite radical. You question whether or not government is even needed to provide so-called law and order. And you use the quote in the, in the beginning of the book. You, quote, you say, economic, you use economic theory to compare institutions and incentives that influence public and private performance in the provision of law and its enforcement. How does economics help us think about law and its enforcement? Well, of course, first of all, law and enforcement involves the use of scarce resources, uh, which means they have to be allocated. Um, and economics is, uh, studies the allocation of scarce resources. Um, the allocation process isn't through markets, of course, uh, unless we talk about bribery and things like that, then, then we get a market uh, kind of process working. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we can look at the institutional environment and think about uh, the incentives that uh, individuals have uh, who are in a position to make these allocation decisions. So uh, really it's, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, the economic model of behavior uh, as uh, in public choice theory, for instance, being taken uh, to the public sector uh, in general and, and to the legal uh, system itself in particular. But, so all of us are fairly used to state provision of law and law enforcement. It's, it's the system we live within and while we know that I – mean, we deal with you know, private security guards occasionally and may have heard about you know, arbitration between parties as opposed to taking disputes to court. For the most part, we just kind of think of state-provided law and law enforcement as the way things work. But in, in the introduction to your book, you make a point of saying that you know, typically we think a, a market – one of the things a market does is provides what the customers want. And you contrast this with, with state-provided law in saying that it – in many ways it fails to provide what people would want, what we might expect in a market. So what are some of the ways that – state law or authoritarian law, as you refer to it, doesn't live up to what the customers desire? Um, well, uh, I guess we uh, can look at uh, what's going on today in places like Baltimore and Cleveland and um, uh, places, uh, uh, Ferguson, Missouri, I guess, uh, where we've seen uh, – significant uh, abuses of, of power by the police um, as one example of uh, uh, the public sector not doing what we want it to do. Um, the, uh, we can uh, see instances, uh, in fact, significant instances where uh, prosecutors decide to uh, drop uh, charges against some individual or decide to plea bargain down to uh, some lower uh, kind of uh, charge. And so the, the victim of the crime really doesn't even uh, get the satisfaction of having the criminal effectively punished if that's uh, what the function of, of the process is. Um, in, uh, in terms of legislation, uh, we, we see uh, all sorts of laws uh, created that actually are not about uh, protecting us uh, from uh, bad things, but are in fact about protecting certain privileged groups uh, from competition or uh, protecting their privileges and so on. Um, uh, so the uh, I just uh, read in the paper uh, <laughs> uh, this morning about uh, the two uh, young girls uh, trying to set up their lemonade stand and, and the police came and shut them down because uh, they didn't have a, a proper license. Is that the kind of thing we want our legal system to be doing? I, I don't think most of us uh, do. 
I was struck when reading your examples of how the, the legal system fails to provide what we want because reading it from a libertarian perspective and, and also being very aware of what's going on in Ferguson and in Baltimore and the story of the girls' lemonade stand being shut down and then these stories of – there was the one just earlier this week about the 11-year-old who was playing alone in his yard for an hour and the parents were arrested and charged with neglect, I believe, and he was sent to Child Protective Services. Um, and I guess I had I had two reactions. I wanted to see if I'm maybe misreading where for one, I would say that I mean we know like if you poll parents, you poll people about should children be allowed to play outside, a shockingly large percent, if not the majority, I believe, think no. Like kids under, you know, kids of an age who used to play outside all the time should not. And it may be driven by kind of the panic attacks people have now about how dangerous they imagine the world has become. Um, at the same time, a lot of the a lot of the rules that you – or a lot of the things where you say the law doesn't give what people want tend to be you, – you say people want harsher sentences than the law currently provides or, or that is enforced that the plea bargaining leads to us basically going easier on criminals than we otherwise might or the market demands. But to me from – especially I mean from a libertarian perspective, those seem like features, not bugs that, that if you – know, if Going easy on yeah, drug, that, cr drug criminals seems like a good thing. Right. If the state is going easier than kind of the vindictiveness of Americans want, I guess I would be kind of hesitant to institute a market that would be as vindictive as the voter wants. Well, that uh, – you're missing the point I guess. But my, my point is that uh, we don't like many of these things that are coming out of the system uh, a different system is going to produce uh, a, a different uh, outcomes. Um, you're not going to have plea bargaining between a, pr a public prosecutor and a uh, and a uh, criminal or the criminal's lawyer in a privatized system. It'll be bargaining, perhaps, be but between the victim and uh, the uh, offender. So you have some perhaps bargaining, perhaps arbitration, perhaps mediation. Um, and uh, the uh, acceptance of the bargain is then not up to some public prosecutor, but it's up to the victim himself. Um, what, uh, what will satisfy the victim? Um, and uh, prior to the uh, rise of criminal law, um, the kinds of things we think of as uh, – uh, crimes today were illegal, but they were uh, illegal in a system of civil uh, liability. Now, now, someone here thinking when you're saying state provided law or publicly provided law, someone's first thought is going to be, well, that's the only choice. Anything else is not meaningfully law, and the idea that there's private provided law is just seems kind of silly to many people but in your book you explain how this is not this is a erroneous concept of law and we haven't always had state provided law in this way in that story so how is that how did that used to be the case that we didn't always have publicly provided law when people say the state has to provide law they're defining law as rules provided by the state so it's a tautology uh, if we want to think of, of rules as uh, uh, the uh, behavior that uh, other people expect us to adopt in uh, various kinds of interaction, then uh, those rules come from lots of places. And in fact, most of the rules we follow in our day-to-day -day life um, are not rules generated by the state. Uh, the state may have at some point written them down, but but they were developed uh, through communities, uh, individuals interacting, contracting, uh, developing for various sorts of uh, mutual uh, insurance arrangements, uh, mutual assistance arrangements, uh, all sorts of uh, system, uh, other sources of law. Uh, you might want – if you don't like the term law, uh, you can call them uh, norms. I call them customary law um, because I think uh, 
that gets at the idea. Uh, my uh, The argument I make is one that is not at all shocking to, say, an anthropologist, um, that law comes from different places. Uh, law can be imposed from the top down, uh, which anthropologists refer to as authoritarian law, or it can come from the bottom up through uh, various forms of voluntary interaction, uh, and that's they call it customary law. Um, the uh, 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 customs uh, that uh, individuals adopt within their communities um, are very powerful in in uh, in many situations. Um, and uh, the uh, if we go back in history, uh, you go to say uh, uh, a number of tribal societies. Um, uh, you find uh, systems where there is no um, legislation, there is no uh, central authority to enforce rules. Nonetheless, uh, these uh, people get along, they interact, they trade, uh, they enter into joint production um, and uh, all sorts of things because they know how each other uh, are, is or they at least – have expectations about how, how each other is going to behave in these situations. A lot of what so you're, there are rules. A lot of these rules that you're describing, these customary rules, are things that we have experience with today. Everything from you know, we know that you, you're supposed to, at least in the United States, you you get in line for something, you queue up, and that's the proper way to handle it. And if you cut in line, people get upset with you or look you at you. Don't double dip chips either. Yeah, we that. we <laughs> have these we have these kind of rules, and we know just behaviors that are appropriate or not. And so thinking about those or thinking about stuff on the margin about, you know, you hire a security guard to protect your factory as opposed to a cop, we get all that. But I think where what you're describing and where the absence of state provided law and enforcement seems particularly weird and where I I guess I'm asking if you could expand on how it worked before how things worked before the rise of the state is in those those things that like the really hard laws, right? The ones like against murder, mm -hmm. um, against you know outright theft, the things where we don't – it doesn't feel right that the way you handle those is to give the person the stink eye or refuse to associate with them. We want some sort of like real enforcement there. Or a blood feud or something along those lines. But blood feuds sound pretty bad. Yes. Uh, and, and so how do you – how did those kinds of issues get settled without a centralized authority? Well, uh, let's just – since we're uh, a uh, common law country, let's go back to uh, England. Um, prior to the uh, this, uh, development of uh, what we might call uh, royal law, law of the kings, um, and uh, think about how those, uh, those kinds of situations were dealt with. Um, there was um, uh, a custom, um, uh, a view that every individual, uh, free individual, had a, a, what was referred to as a peace. Uh, essentially, the individual had property rights. They had property rights to their uh, uh, homes, uh, perhaps to uh, farmland, uh, to the cattle and horses and sheep that they had and so on. Um, and the expectation was that everyone uh, would respect each other's peace. Uh, well, uh, some people don't expect, uh, respect the law. They certainly don't today and, and uh, they didn't then. So how did they deal with them? Uh, well, uh, the typical... Uh, community of, of freemen uh, would uh, form uh, sort of mutual insurance arrangements, uh, reciprocity kinds of things. Uh, they called them uh, the tithing and the hundred, uh, or that that's at least what uh, historians have named them. Um, and the idea was that they would cooperate in various uh, activities. Um, if cattle strayed off the uh, 
uh, he, uh, the individual could call on his neighbors, the, the tithing to go help him find them. Uh, if uh, he was robbed, he could call on his neighbors to go uh, pursue the, uh, the robber. Um, if uh, they had obligations to maintain the road uh, network or network of paths within the community, so path crosses somebody's property, they were supposed to keep it clean so other people could use them. Um, this was all built on uh, frequent interaction and uh, reciprocity among these individuals. Now, um, the uh, uh, if there was a dispute as to whether they caught the right bad man, uh, the right robber, um, there was also a court system uh, that uh, worked uh, at the uh, hundred level. Uh, there was a court, uh, but it was not a, a court backed by uh, the king or something like that. It was uh, uh, representatives of each tithing would act essentially as a judge and jury, um, and they would uh, decide on uh, guilt or innocence. Um, and if there was a, a finding of guilt, then the expectation was uh, that uh, the offender... Uh, would pay restitution to uh, the plaintiff. So if you've got uh, uh, someone was robbed, uh, the, the court would come up with uh, an appropriate restitution. In fact, uh, it was a pretty common uh, uh, understanding about what the payments uh, would be for various kinds of offenses depending on the situations and so on. So how would how do they enforce that though? How do they make sure that you paid? Well, the uh, uh, first uh, of all, of course, uh, if uh, uh, the individual couldn't pay, um, they uh, would uh, they had alternatives. Uh, for instance, uh, um, these were mutual insurance arrangements. So one community. The, if a member of that community uh, owed restitution to somebody, they might pay the restitution uh, for the individual, and then the individual would owe his own uh, neighbors and friends. Um, the uh, <clears throat> if uh, the individual refused to uh, accept uh, the court's judgment, uh, uh, the individual would be. Um, declared an outlaw, essentially uh, word would spread that this individual uh, is outside the law, no longer protected by his own community, uh, and uh, essentially he's free game. Um, his property could be taken and so on. Uh, that uh, might sound harsh, but uh, of course the police are seizing assets today from people who haven't done anything but maybe uh, violated traffic law. Um, so uh, the uh, outlawry, while it might sound trivial today, uh, was a significant thing back then because you had to have protection from uh, within your community uh, in order to uh, survive uh, in that environment. Uh, if you were an outsider, you did not uh, go into another community uh, without uh, being voluntarily accepted by that other community. Now, the point that you make uh, in the book, uh, you make many points, but the point that about restitution is incredibly powerful uh, and something a lot of people haven't thought about. When, and, I, and I pointed out to people that isn't it strange that if I get into a fender bender with someone, me or my insurance company pays them, but if I punch someone in a bar or someone punches me, uh, they, they pay the state. Or, and then, and that's supposedly a crime of which the victim receives nothing, and that is kind of a head scratcher. It's so common. Oh, a crime is a, a, the people versus the the king versus. It's so common that we don't even think about that. It's really strange. How did it come to be that you are paying the state when you committed crimes against people? Well. Uh let, let me say, first of all, it came about slowly, gradually, um, and not uh, without substantial resistance. 
the uh, uh, the system of hundreds and tithing and the restitution system, uh, referred to often as the man price system, um, was uh, essentially uh, universal in these communities. And they inclu- the, the system included everyone, uh, the wealthy, the powerful, uh, the uh, poorest uh, farmer, and so on. Um, and uh, so uh, the king, uh, as, uh, the king, of course, uh, the kings came uh, uh, arose in England not to establish and enforce law, but to fight wars. Um, they were typically war chiefs who uh, ultimately were able to claim um, some sort of divine right or uh, some uh, sort of authority that uh, would allow them to uh, lead uh, armies and that sort of thing. Um, but then, of course, uh, they, needed, uh, they needed funding to uh, maintain or uh, – be active in their wars, uh, and so they start looking for ways uh, to uh, fund uh, their operations. The king's primary source of income, the early kings, was essentially the uh, uh, produce from their various estates. Uh, They had lots of different estates around the country, and they travel from one to another and consume what was produced there. They didn't have much in the way of money uh, coming in. Uh, that uh, was liquid that could be uh, used to buy other things. Uh, so they're looking for ways to uh, get money. Well, one uh, avenue uh, was uh, the king's peace. Everyone had a peace. The king had a peace too. Uh, but the king uh, has power in that he has military forces and so on. Uh, and and the support of other powerful individuals. And so uh, he started expanding uh, the king's peace. Um, for instance... Was he, the king's uh, peace a, a, a geographically assigned or was it temporarily no, assigned? No, jurisdictionally assigned. Juris- okay. uh, for instance, he, he would declare that um, a, uh, a foreign traveler um, in the kingdom... Um, would not have uh, the protection of a local tithing or hundred. And so if that individual was uh, attacked, um, the king would step in um, and uh, pursue justice. But it was a pursuit of uh, justice in the sense that the king got the compensation, not the traveler. Um, and so uh, you you lose that link between uh, uh, punishment and restitution, and it becomes punishment uh, with no restitution to the victim. Um, of course, most traveling groups, and so, uh, especially the merchants and the churches and so on, traveled with uh, protection anyway, so uh, w- this isn't a big deal. Uh, it sounds like a good thing. It sounds like, wow, the king is stepping in to protect people uh, who are traveling, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, so, uh, you know, some minor sorts of changes like that start occurring. Uh, the king declares that his peace extends to uh, uh, the major holiday periods. So any offense committed during... Uh, a certain holiday period uh, is a, an offense against the king, and and the money goes to the king. The restitution payment or compensation payment goes to the king. Uh, by uh, a- after the Normans uh, uh, invaded, uh, much more powerful kings. Um, within a century or so, uh, you start seeing a distinction between uh, crime and criminal law and civil law uh, that hadn't existed before. And the distinction essentially was um, with criminal law, the king gets the money. With uh, civil law, uh, the victim gets the money. And uh, the king is constantly expanding his, uh, his jurisdiction, his peace to sweep in uh, more and more uh, opportunities uh, to collect money. Uh, 
law enforcement was a revenue generator for the king uh, initially, uh, and and that made it very attractive. So it, was, it, it still is. I mean, that's what that was what was striking about reading this is that it it was one of those kind of aha that makes so much sense now sorts of moments. I mean, because we, you know, one of the things that came out in the aftermath of the Ferguson situation was the enormous percentage of the city's budget that came from these fines that they were levying on their citizens, that they kept just jacking up the fines and jacking up the number of things you could be fined for. It was like 60 percent of the municipal budget. I mean, right. And so they had every incentive was for them to just harass and fine their citizens and see them not as people that they ought to protect but as a source of revenue. Yeah. And, and people just don't realize how important this has become. Um, in the area of uh, uh, drug enforcement, for instance, uh, the uh, uh, since the early 1980s, uh, we've seen lots of changes in asset seizure laws that allow uh, uh, civil seizures. Uh, all they have to do is suspect that someone has committed uh, a crime or that they purchased some asset with uh, um, proceeds from a crime, and the police can seize that property. Um, there are uh, lots of police agencies around the country that uh, whose uh, budget is uh, a substantial part of their budget uh, comes from seizing assets uh, from people who haven't even been arrested uh, or charged. Um, and, uh, and so you've got these fines, uh, asset seizures, all sorts of uh, activities that uh, are um, gener generating revenues uh, for the government or for the policing uh, agency or something like that. So, but someone's probably thinking right now I mean, that, that pushing back. So, okay, so, so criminal law is developed as a money making scheme for kings in the state. Uh, but at the same time, if we don't assume that kings are entirely nefarious people, which may not be a bad assumption, but if we don't think they're entirely nefarious, maybe they said, well, the crime is not being prevented well enough by this system of restitution and, and private provision of, of security. And so one thing I need to do for my subjects as a good and, and decent king, like, like King Richard and Robin Hood or something like that, is to give them protection and step in to help out the people who – don't have enough money to pay for their security firm or are not being a, assisted by the community. And yeah, I'll take some money from the people to help me do that better because that costs resources. But overall, it's a better system wherein to, to prevent and to protect people via this criminal law uh, rather than the restitution system before. So it's actually a positive evolution forward of the state taking over something that it should be taking over in the first place. Well, I, that's a good story. Uh Unfortunately, it's false. Um, the the kings did not take over the policing function or the protection function. Uh, they just took over the collection function, I guess you might say. Um, the uh, the kings uh, relied on the uh, local uh, voluntary policing arrangements uh, to. Uh, collect their own fines. Uh, in fact, uh, they, uh, as the king took more and more of the money, uh, shifted it out of restitution into uh, essentially fines, um, the uh, local communities resisted. They didn't want to uh, take people to court uh, uh, to try to collect restitution because they weren't going to get restitution anymore. They were going to get uh, money for the king. Um, so uh, they would try to avoid that through direct bargaining, for instance, with the offender and, and various things like that. Uh, it also creates incentives to use violence against the offender rather than uh, um, uh, actually trying to get a, a, a peaceful settlement. Um, and so you get a period uh, as uh, the kings are trying to uh, expand their jurisdiction but still have the local communities do the policing uh, where you get a lot of resistance. And, and so the, there's a sort of uh, give and take through uh, over a century when um, uh, 
the kings would uh, demand more and more uh, of the money and the local communities would just quit doing their policing stuff. And so the king would have to back off some and let them collect some restitution. Uh, and so they'd start doing their policing stuff again. Um, ultimately, uh, the uh, system of tithing and hundred broke down. Uh, the policing function just, uh, there was no policing. Um, and uh, so then the king, uh, this was after the Norman invasion, um, created uh, what was called the Frank Pledge System, which essentially ordered these communities to do uh, policing in order to collect the revenues for the king um, without compensation. Uh, and so you get uh, uh, a, uh, an effort uh, to use force to force people to uh, pursue criminals uh, when previously they'd done so voluntarily because of reciprocities and, and the recognition that they uh, were helping neighbors who would later help them and that sort of thing. Now, you mentioned that in the book, you mentioned that they even made it illegal to go outside of the system to solve the crime by your, or restitution situation by yourself. Uh, yeah. And, or to put, I think at one point you mentioned that to put ads in the paper just asking for the return of stolen property, no questions asked. They made those illegal because they wanted to collect fines. Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, yeah. And so you have a, a long series of laws trying to force the local communities to do the policing functions. Um, the uh, uh, as we move through time, um, the the king starts creating local officials, um, justices of the peace, for instance, who would be ordered to organize the policing and and see that offenders get taken to court and that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> they were ordered to do so uh, uh, without compensation as well. Uh, the king didn't want to spend money on, on law enforcement. They just wanted to collect revenues from law enforcement. So uh, harsh, uh, harsh uh, punishment. In the, actually, uh, uh, I read, I can't remember where, uh, what uh, his, historian uh, wrote about this system where uh, essentially – Every community in England at one time or another was fined for failing to do its policing duties. Um, and <clears throat> some of these places and some of these individuals would rather pay the fine than do the policing stuff. Um, but then you also start seeing organizations, um, private organizations that uh, join together um, to – uh, take on some of these functions that the king was trying to do in, in a relatively uh, efficient way. So, uh, for instance, uh, there were uh, organizations where, um, oh, I forgot to mention, uh, the victim was in, expected to prosecute. So the victim was ordered to bring witnesses to trial and, and uh, pursue charges against the uh, offender, even though the victim was uh, not going to be compensated. Uh, so the victim uh, was not only comp uh, no longer getting restitution, but he was expected to have uh, bear more costs in order to uh, collect the money for uh, the uh, king. And this, uh, of course, uh, led to people demanding some sort of uh, uh, re uh, restitution or retribution if they couldn't get restitution. Uh, and so you start seeing increasing uh, levels of uh, really nasty sorts of punishment, uh, capital punishment being uh, an obvious one, but all these uh, stories about uh, people being uh, put on the rack and, and things like that start uh, coming into play uh, after the king takes over the process because uh, uh, the, the people themselves are not being satisfied with the system. But anyway, the uh, arrangements uh, would um, uh, oftentimes, uh, depending on if it was a business group, for instance, they might hire uh, a private uh, security type individuals uh, who would then uh, pursue criminals and, and uh, bring them to justice. Um, the uh, 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 
the the king never really stepped in until uh, into uh, the uh, uh, east. There's a period where um, there's punishments are getting so harsh for trivial kinds of crimes that the people in the country uh, in general didn't want to impose those punishments. Uh, but the only alternative to punishment uh, uh, for uh, physical punishment was to uh, convict the individual for a relatively minor, a really minor crime, and then they were branded as criminals. Um, the uh, juries then uh, were nullifying uh, royal law by refusing to hang people for minor cases of, of theft and things like that, uh, and uh, simply uh, branding them as thieves and letting them loose. Th those were the choices, essentially. And um, so uh, there was demand to do something about this and uh, demand to uh, come up with ways of, of dealing with these criminals that was uh, somewhere in between punish, uh, capital punishment and, um, and branding. Um, and uh, the king started transporting criminals uh, then to uh, the uh, colonies in the Americas and, and uh, in Africa and places like that. Even then, of course, the king wasn't spending any money. Um, he uh, franchised a uh, particular... Uh, firm to uh, do the transporting, and the firm got its money by selling uh, indentured servants uh, uh, to uh, contracts to uh, the colonials uh, when they transported these criminals over to them. Um, so uh, anyway, you start uh, seeing a, a new development, transportation, uh, as a replacement for capital punishment. Um, and then transportation gets cut off with the American uh, Revolution, um, and uh, so they put these uh, so-called hulks in the Thames River, um, these big dead ships essentially uh, would sit there and they'd uh, put more and more of these criminals onto these ships, uh, waiting uh, for transportation to start up again. Um, and uh, it didn't, of course. And at that point, they start. Uh, the king ultimately has to start paying something uh, to get rid of these criminals. Uh, it was very expensive, but they transported a lot of them to Australia. Um, finally, uh, you start getting uh, prisons built um, to house these individuals, um, and uh, you see a shift from. Uh, the criminal process being a money generator for the king uh, and the central government to a system where uh, it's increasingly costly. Um, um, and that, that, that's what we see today, of course, is a, a system that's extremely costly uh, to the government. It's still, a, as you say, a revenue-generating system, but the revenues are being generated uh, for uh, local communities and, and local police departments and things like that, whereas uh, taxpayers are paying huge amounts for prisons and, and, and so on. I wanted to talk a bit about the really fascinating analysis you give in the book of the incentives that exist within the legal system that we have today and how those cause problems specifically in, in the legislative process and then among – judges and then among the police. But I did have a quick question before we move on to that. You've told – the story you've told so far has been about England yeah. um, and, then, and then America. Can we tell a similar story about other parts of the world? Because after all, other parts of the world have the same sort of authoritarian state-driven law that we have in the West. Well, uh, certainly, um, you know, we got our law from England. Um, so did uh, Australia and Canada and, and uh, South Africa and so on. Um, so the background uh, 
for the development of the law uh, was uh, the same for all of those countries. Other European countries had uh, similar uh, processes um, as uh, as kings became more and more powerful. Um, the uh, I have not uh, taken uh, uh, a deep look at, uh, say, Asian uh, societies and that sort of thing. So I, I can't uh, affirm, uh, be uh, strongly affirm that. Um, but uh, on the other hand, something like the tithing and the hundred uh, has existed, has developed essentially everywhere. Um, it really was a, uh, a, an institutional arrangement that, was, uh, that evolved out of tribal uh, arrangements. Um, and uh, so those tribal arrangements, uh, you find the same sorts of things uh, uh, in New Guinea and, and uh, uh, the Philippines where you're still finding these tribes. Uh, and so uh, you certainly uh, can find um, lots of uh, hints that the same process has, has occurred. Um, and uh, pretty strong hints in, in places. I, I I honestly can't say whether the same story uh, tracks in China, for instance. Although uh, I suspect it does. Well, then then let's yeah then let's turn to that analysis of so that I mean it's basically it's a public choice analysis of our modern legal system. Uh, what let's start with the I guess the lawmaking process. I mean, one of the things that you point out is that. When the state is the one making laws, when you have the centralized authority, you end up with different interest groups operating who each may have their own goals that work across purposes. Um, and one of the, I think, really interesting things was that we end up as a result often with far more laws than we ought to have because incentives exist to create more and more and more laws and that also those laws have a focus that often doesn't make a lot of sense from the perspective of what we what we really ought to have or really want to have. Can you tell us a bit about why that happens, how that happens? Think about the uh, uh, the example I just discussed about the the, the king's uh, creation of criminal law uh, over time. Um, or when they when they tried to force the local communities to do the policing, the local communities resisted. So they're creating, they're passing laws that say local community do this uh, policing activity uh, and the local community is refusing. And so they pass more laws uh, trying to uh, force them to uh, uh, do these duties um, and threaten them with fines if they don't, and so on. Uh, and so you see a, a growing uh, set of rules uh, attempting to force a community to do something it doesn't want to do. Um, the same sort of thing happens uh, all the time uh, when, uh, when we think of our customary law uh, – Evolving from the bottom up, it's, it essentially means the community as a whole is agreeing voluntarily uh, to accept these rules. Uh, they're not going to voluntarily accept rules that discriminate against them. So they tend to be fair, uh, unbiased kinds of rules that come out of these systems. Uh, there's some bizarre rules that come out of them too, uh, oftentimes uh, in, in uh, primitive societies because they don't understand various things and so on, and, and uh, they uh, create some rule to uh, <laughs> do something uh, they think will help. But um, those, those rules don't uh, have any effect. On the other hand, when uh, the state creates a rule that says, you know, you got to do something, um, the uh, individuals who are targeted by that rule don't want to do what the state says, and so they find ways to avoid it. Um, and the, the, the uh, legislature can never anticipate all the kinds of adjustments people are going to make. People are pretty entrepreneurial uh, in finding ways around the law. 
Uh, and so you get uh, a, uh, uh, a method of bypassing or circumventing the law um, created by the state. And so they have to create another law to block that. Um, and uh, then they have to have more police and, and so on. I, I always tell my students about uh, the 55 mile an hour speed limit that was passed uh, back uh, in the 70s, um, the uh, uh, police, uh, of course, had uh, the, uh, these, well, uh, individuals, first of all, um, truckers all had CB radios, and so they'd uh, call each other and warn them about uh, police uh, uh, stings and, and, you know, uh, traffic stops and things like that, and so they would avoid uh, these speed limits. They'd drive over the speed limit uh, and, and avoid being ticketed, um, and so they had to have uh, tried to create some rules about how, what you could do with these CB radios. Um, they then developed the radar uh, guns to detect speeders uh, some distance down the road. But then, of course, the private sector comes up with a re- radar detector, uh, which uh, could be installed in cars. And so they, uh, the state had to make those illegal um, in order to uh, uh, ma- use their uh, enforcement methods. And so... Uh, You just get this spiraling process of more and more laws uh, trying to force people to do things they don't want to do. I think a a good analogy um, to the kind of laws that come from customary norms uh, versus the ones that are imposed on the top down is is an informal pickup baseball game that that kids play in a backyard versus the formal little league system – is when you have the informal pickup baseball game, everyone kind of has to respect everyone else because you're trying to make everyone happy and, and people you don't want people to go home because the rules are, are not working for them. And so you have you adjust the rules on the fly and you have this kind of emergent system trying to make everyone happy and have everyone having a good time. And then Little League, it's not that way. You sort of debate the rules, uh, applying everyone from the top down and uh, try and have a different goal in that kind of authoritarian order. And a lot of times the kids Kids don't enjoy it as much as just the pickup baseball game in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a, a good analogy. Uh, I believe that's you know, from Steve I, Horowitz. I, I, it's from Steve Horowitz. Yeah, Steve just Horowitz. To, to give that credit up. where credit's due. And Peter Gray is a is a guy who wrote an essay on that, which we can link in the show notes, uh, which I think is a good analogy. Um, the the I think uh, the, the story is really fascinating, and there and there's so much in the book uh, more than we've even touched on. Uh, but the someone's thinking. What is the relevance? Well, we talked about Ferguson and we talked about various problems but but the story of, of pr- a primitive past uh, using a primitive quote unquote, like legal system and then evolving forward uh, and now this doesn't apply. We don't live in small towns or small tribes where we have reputation uh, is a huge thing and reciprocity. We have much bigger areas. So uh, you know, are we saying this was better and we should go back to not having state law now? Does this even apply anymore? Does, what are the lessons that we can learn from the development of authoritarian law and how can we apply them now? Uh, well, I – no, personally, I wouldn't want to live uh, in uh, Papua New Guinea in one of those tribal societies that still have uh, predominantly private law. Or blood feuds. Uh, I mean, isn't authoritarian law better than blood feuds? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, uh, uh, a, a, um, Francisco Parisi, I think his name is, uh, uh, wrote a very good interesting paper about about blood feud uh, and essentially explained uh, that um, restitution uh, arrangements evolved out of the blood feud to uh, to mitigate the uh, uh, violence uh, associated with the blood feud and and I've written I've, I've studied the Pashtun tribes in Afghanistan where you see the same sort of thing. Uh, they uh, have a uh, blood feud kind of legal system, but there's all sorts of ways to avoid uh, the, the blood feud. Um, and uh, Parisi's story is uh, simply that um, 
uh, with no legal system, essentially, people would take revenge on uh, people that uh, harmed them. Um, and uh, but people lived in communities, and, and the, these kinds of violent uh, conflicts uh, and feuds uh, could spread and had generate significant negative uh, impacts on the rest of the community. Uh, so there's uh, pressures uh, starting to build to uh, alleviate uh, this problem of, of violence, uh, and and so the result. Uh, is uh, that um, a, a customary norm uh, develops uh, that says uh, you cannot take uh, more in retribution than uh, you uh, initially suffered. Uh, it's the eye for an eye kind of idea. Um, and, uh, of course, that means then uh, that... You start, you have uh, a, an objective thing that er, both parties uh, anticipate uh, is going to occur. Um, I put out somebody's eye. Uh, the expectation is that that guy or one of his uh, friends or, or family is going to try to put my eye out. Well, um, I don't want to lose my eye. Uh, maybe I can offer him some money not to do it. Um, and, uh, so as a replacement for, uh, revenge, uh, you get, uh, negotiation and payment. Um, and ultimately then, uh, the, the order of, uh, events shifts. Initially it was revenge, uh, but you can negotiate and ultimately it becomes, uh, negotiate, go through a, a fair, uh, trial, something like that, and then if it doesn't uh, work, you can take revenge. Um, so you. Uh, so what are the lessons for for today? From from for today yeah, well, uh, from this idea that there could be private law and private provision of law. What what are the lessons for today? I mean, should well, we can we scrap what we've got and go back to a fully private system? Is that would that be inadvisable? Well, I. I what I would like to see uh, is just uh, opening up, legalizing lots of private alternatives. Then if the state can compete, fine. Uh, but if they can't compete, uh, they go out of business. Um, a, a modern example in, in Japan, um, if uh, an individual commits uh, a crime against another individual, um, and that individual gets caught. Uh, he uh, typically uh, a representative of that individual, someone in his family, perhaps, or something like that, will go to the victim and say, boy, uh, this guy's really sorry for what he did. Uh, is there something he could do to uh, alleviate your suffering? Um, and... Uh, so you get a, a, a negotiation, uh, oftentimes with the help of, of a mediator, um, where ultimately the uh, offender pays a compensation to the victim. Um, and if the victim is satisfied, he writes a letter to the uh, judge uh, who's going to try this guy and says he was remorseful, he's compensated me. Uh, you shouldn't punish him uh, too severely. Um, uh, that works pretty well. Uh, you don't hear nearly as much about uh, uh, crime and, and uh, prison riots and things like that in Japan as you do here. Um, that doesn't eliminate crime. There's always crime or uh, offenses. But um, another example, uh, in... Uh, Lots of communities now, uh, there are uh, what are called victim offender mediation programs uh, where a, an organization, maybe a church, uh, some private uh, organization, develops a program uh, to, uh, well, 
prosecutors actually like it uh, oftentimes because it relieves cr- court crowding, uh, crowding uh, where they divert uh, the offender into a mediation setting uh, where they sit down at a, typically at a table with the victim, uh, a mediator, any other affected parties, perhaps members of, of families and so on. Uh, they talk about it. The offender, uh, uh, I mean, the victim is able to actually tell the offender how uh, much harm uh, was done. The offender uh, sees the victim as a real person instead of just some uh, someone they didn't know that they took something from. Uh, the they negotiate a contract uh, uh, for. Uh, compensation it doesn't have to be money. Um, some uh, the offender might uh, agree to mow somebody's lawn for a year or uh, do some other sort of task for a period of time, uh, or they agree to pay uh, or uh, something like that. Anyway, about uh, I, the last thing I read suggested that. About 95% of these uh, victor offender mediation efforts lead to a contract. Uh, and uh, a, something like uh, 92% of the contracts are fulfilled. Um, well, that sure is a lot uh, less costly way to deal with these uh, offenders than putting them in prison where we spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year to house them and feed them. Um, the the uh, offender uh, is perhaps doing productive work uh, and uh, the victim is being uh, compensated for the loss. These uh, kinds of programs uh, are spreading. Uh, really, um, there's lots of them in New Zealand. Uh, there are uh, uh, growing numbers in, in Canada and the United States. Uh, we see them cropping up in, in Europe now. Um, so it's, it's in a sense, it's a move back to restitution. And perhaps just but one of the worst things that the, the authoritarian system does is it, it keeps us from thinking about new ways of solving problems that arise and keeps us thinking in this one state-centered type of way. Well, it doesn't just – I mean it, it keeps us thinking that way because it doesn't I mean it bans the alternatives, yeah. right? So we can't even yeah. – I mean that's the thing is when you talk to people, you even raise the topic of we could have law enforcement, we could have law creation without the state. It seems you know, as silly as the notion of could democracy. Have money without the state. Yeah, like oh, or, you know, if you if you when you were describing democracy to to the people of Europe, you know, a millennia ago, it sounds just as crazy, um, and it's in large part because the state does everything it can to stamp out those alternatives before they get a chance to get off the ground. Yeah, um, you know, why don't we have? Uh, someone might say, why don't we have private police? Uh, the answer is we do uh, where it's allowed, <laughs> where where the state doesn't uh, prevent it. Um, and we do in many cases where the state does try to prevent it. Um, the uh, the railroad system in the United States and Canada has a, its a private police force. Um, lots of uh, corporations have their own security system uh, with uh, large numbers of security personnel. Um, it, so if the state allows these individuals uh, or these firms to um, engage in policing-like activities, uh, the private sector will produce it. Um, right now, uh, the, the dominant uh, function of the private sector in terms of what we think of as policing activities is in protection. Uh, because uh, that is uh, allowed essentially everywhere. You can hire private security to protect your home or your business uh, and so on. And and there are uh, estimates of uh, perhaps three times as many private security personnel in the U.S. as there are public police. Um, and, th- and these people range everywhere from the typical sort of stereotypical night watchman or uh, mall cop to uh, 
highly trained, uh, sophisticated uh, private uh, firms and, and personnel guarding all of our uh, nuclear facilities in the United States, uh, guarding all of our chemical facilities in the United States. Uh, used to guard, uh, used to deal with airports, now we have TSA. Uh, I, I would invite a, a, a careful comparison of uh, the, uh, the two with airports. I think uh, we made a huge mistake uh, moving uh, to public provision of airport security. Um, so there, there are all of the, everything that we think of as a function of the state in terms of law and law enforcement is in fact uh, being done uh, or has been done by the private sector. Um, and there's always this uh, give and take tug of war uh, as people try to uh, move things into the private arena and state tries to pull them back into the public arena and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's something that people don't really uh, notice. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org. 